So I am super excited to chat with today's guest. We have Evan Brand here, and he is going to be chatting about the mold gut thyroid connection. And so I'm going to dive into Evan's impressive bio here. He's a board certified. He's board certified in holistic nutrition and is a functional nutrition therapy practitioner who has transformed the lives of thousands of clients with his online practice by finding and fixing the root causes of fatigue, depression, anxiety, digestive, and other issues. Evan solves his own health struggles using the same advanced lab testing strategies and protocols that he now uses in the clinic. And he's accumulated over 22 million downloads of his podcast and has been featured on hundreds of other po health podcasts, webinars, summits, as well as practitioner training events. And he also offers at-home functional medicine training courses through his Functional Academy of Medicine and Epigenetics, also known as his Frame, uh, is it Fame Network, I guess, uh, Fame Framework, you would say, um, yeah. on gut molds and energy issues. Uh, and all right, well, thank you so much for joining us, Evan. Appreciate you being here. Oh, man, thanks for having me. I was looking back because I had you on my podcast. It was six years ago, 2017. Oh, wow. Wow, that long. Yeah. So uh, again, it's great to have you now on my podcast. I know you're going to share a wealth of information with the listeners. And let's give a little bit of your background for those who aren't familiar with you. How did you start doing what you're doing today and, and you know, do, get to the point where you, you're, you, you have one of the top podcasts out there in health? Yeah, well, the podcast is really just a way for me to learn, right? I mean, I was kind of in it for myself in the beginning because it was very difficult to reach some of these practitioners, naturopaths and functional medicine people that knew a lot. It was really difficult. You'd have to fly to their clinic or you'd have to pay, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars an hour to get a hold of these people. And I thought, well, what if I just start interviewing them and I can get information from them to help myself? Well, then as I started to get better, I thought, well, hey, other people need these, need these uh, pieces of advice, these pieces of information and practitioners are booked. People are booked out. So, why don't I start helping people? So I had uh, personal training certifications at the time, and then I went into Nutritional Therapy Association and picked up the FNTP credential, which taught me food is medicine, and also I learned a lot of hands-on things that I ended up using in a brick-and-mortar practice. So I actually worked out of a, a chiropractic physician's office for a while, and I started getting his patients so healthy that they didn't need an adjustment every week. So... Uh, that was a natural parting of the ways there, and I left the brick and mortar and went full time uh, online with my practice in 2015. And at the time, it was the Wild West; nobody was really doing online telemedicine in 2015. I know that sounds like yesterday, but you know that was in the internet world. That was a long time ago, and uh, it was a new idea. People were like, "Wait a second! You know, I can stay here in Oregon or Idaho or California, and you're going to send test kits to my house?" Like that was kind of odd. But it really, I guess I was ahead of my time there because now a lot of the practitioners that reach out to me for coaching, I do a lot of uh, doctor and business coaching nowadays, and I'm coaching these people to convert their brick and mortars. Like I had a guy in, in the middle of California, Beverly Hills, 70-something-year-old doctor. He's been practicing uh, conventional MD. He's been practicing for like 35 years. And now you know we've taken this guy from 25 employees and $40,000 a month in rent for his you know, Beverly Hills office to now he's just online. He's got like two employees and he's happier than he's ever been. So uh, my, my joy and love now is helping other practitioners, but also I still do uh, clinical work three days a week. And so I'll have people from California to like yesterday, uh, Australia, South Africa, all across Europe, you know, people that are just seeking answers that they can't find locally, people that have been to five, 10, 20 different doctors. Then they call me as the last, the last effort, the last hoorah. And usually we uncover things that have never been uncovered before. So it's a true blessing. All right. That is a awesome story. And that's also funny w w about with the working for a chiropractor and then just getting people better to the point where they didn't need weekly adjustments. So uh, b being a fellow chiropractor, I can understand maybe the chiropractors in the practice not being too happy about that. But obviously, that's that's good. That's what you want. You don't want someone to come in on a weekly or coming in two, three times a week for many, many weeks, many, many months. 
Yeah, it so, was uh, funny how it worked out. You know, I think it was a lot of it was probably adrenal issues, and then obviously nutrition was a big piece of it as well. I still implement a lot of nutritional therapy strategies, but you know, these these were people back in Kentucky where they're just eating garbage. You know, they'd come in with their big Polar Pop, which is just giant. I don't even know what it is. Probably sixty four ounce soda, and they'll put that down and put down their Oreos and then get adjusted and go right back to the bag of Doritos in their purse afterwards. You know, it was just a mess. So um, I I encourage people that if you are in a a brick and mortar practice like that, and maybe you do have a lot of hands on skills, I would try to implement the things that, you know, we're talking about today because you can increase their health and you can increase their outcome. So if you're worried about the, the financial piece of it, like, Hey, well, what if I get everybody so well, you know, then they don't need adjustments every week. Well, now they're going to tell all their friends, their families, their brothers, their sisters, like, hey, this guy turned my life around. And so the referrals that you'll get will will totally uh, maximize your ability to help more and you'll generate more revenue if you're freaked out about like, hey, I'm going to get people so well, there'll be nobody left to help. I promise that won't happen. Now, how long have you been helping people with mold, which is the topic, the mold gut thyroid connection? Because I, I, I know you, you recently started, or maybe it hasn't been recent. How long have you been um, speaking for Great Plains? Now they're mosaic diagnostics, I believe, but you've been yeah. lecturing for them. So how, yeah, how long of a focus have you had on, on mold issues? Uh, well, it started in, I guess it would have been 2017 or 2018. So my wife and I built the house and it was on a crawl space foundation, which is a terrible idea. Don't do crawl spaces. Try to do a slab or even a walkout basement would be better than a crawl space because the crawl space is basically a basement that you can't see. You know, you're not down there to, to check on it. And so we built this new house and I love trees. So I plant trees everywhere I move to. And we had this water hose connected to the house. And yeah, I was dumb. I was watering trees in the winter and, and I thought I needed to. And I left the hose on and it froze. And then that busted what's called a silcock valve in the crawl space. So we had some water in there and that evaporates up into the home and creates mold. So I was having blood pressure issues and all sorts of problems. And my friend, uh, Jack Wolfson, he's a cardiologist. I texted him and I was like, Hey, I'm having these weird blood pressure issues and I'm dizzy when I wake up. And he texted me back one word in all caps and said mold. So after that day, my life was never the same. And my wife and I were kind of reminiscing and, and laughing uh, about it because, I mean, it's not funny because it put me through hell and we're still recovering. But uh, when I went to investigate, uh, I got stung by a wasp at the same time. So it's like I found the water and I got a wasp sting on my hand at the same time. And uh, wow. it was uh, a whole cascade of, of symptoms. So I'd say 2018 is when it all started. And now you and I are recording here late summer 2023. I don't think I'm a hundred percent. I don't know if you ever fully get a hundred percent back from a mold incident because your immune system gets affected, your endocrine system gets affected, your GI system gets affected, your brain, specifically your limbic system, gets affected to where now you're stuck in fight or flight, whether you want to or not. You become more hypersensitive. So I had debilitating chemical sensitivity to all sorts of fragrances, laundry, dryer sheets. I'm still sensitive to it. Like if I'm around people, I don't like it. I want people to be fragrance free. It's better for your health and better for others. But you know, I still react to it, but it's far, far less, maybe 90% less than it used to be. Yeah. So, so you're a lot better, not, not quite where you, where you need to be or not quite. Well, like, like, like you said, I mean, you might not get to a hundred percent. And I guess it's also a lesson for those listening who might be dealing with mold toxicity. This isn't a three month process. It's not a six month process or, I mean, well, let me ask you, can it be a three or six month process or is it something where no matter the case, it's probably going to be like a few years before you get to the point where again, maybe not a hundred percent, but maybe you're ninety five percent or ninety eight percent. Yeah, well, the fastest recovery was in a three year old little boy. So we ran his organic acids test, and he was colonized. And we also ran his mycotoxin profile. Uh, do you post video or do you just post audio for your podcast? For well, the podcast portion is just uh, audio, but I do post this on YouTube. So if oh, you want you to okay. share anything, we could. Yeah, you could right. do that. Well, Let's do it because, you know, pictures a thousand words, right? So I'll show you a case that kind of answers the question of timeline because uh, many people are unrealistic with their expectations. So 
Um, as you know, I love the oat test. It's amazing. This is a first morning urine sample that people run and you get it back to the lab. And when you have yeast or mold issues, you'll then spit off these organic acids. And so we can infer based on what we find in the urine, what's happening internally. So you can see here in this poor boy, this is a three-year-old, by the way, three-year-old little boy. Mother uh, had five children, ended up working on the whole family and mom. And they had tree roots that busted through the foundation in their home. And they had water that came into the basement and they all had mold toxicity. So you can see here, this marker, 5-hydroxymethyl-2 ferroic. For the folks listening, we're just looking at these long words that indicate that this boy was growing and or he was colonized for aspergillus, probably in the gut, but also the sinuses. And then arabinose was very high, so we knew he had a candida problem. Bacterial overgrowth was a mess. Um, he had some clostridia, which we'll often see if you have mold. A lot of times you'll see mitochondrial issues too. So people with chronic fatigue, there's a massive link between mold and chronic fatigue. In his case, neurotransmitters were okay, but a lot of times you'll see low dopamine because ochratoxin, which is one of the most popular, most common mycotoxins we find, that affects the part of the brain that makes dopamine. So we'll often see issues with energy and drive and focus and concentration. In his case, he looked okay. Nutrient levels, we'll often see those crash out quite a bit. So this was in... April of 21. So we put together a protocol and then we retested in April of 22. So just less than a year and you can see we pretty much fixed everything. There's no more colonization, no more candida at all. Tiny bit of bacterial overgrowth on this one, but the clostridia was normalized. So that's about the fastest you can do it in my opinion would be a year. And it doesn't mean it's a year to feel better. It just means a year to really resolve it. And that would be really fast, especially if you've been sick for 20, 30, 40 years. People have to know and remember that if you had mold exposure when you were a kid and genetically you don't detox it well, and now you're listening to this and you're 52 years old and you want to get better in a year, that's unrealistic. You've had this stuff for five decades. You're not going to get it out in a year. So I think it's important for the practitioner to kind of set realistic expectations of the timeline because... Uh, we're so used to that conventional medicine model, right? You take antibiotics for a week and everything's better, and that's just not the case. And you're going to feel better gradually, though, sometimes within just a couple of weeks or a couple of months, using the right protocol, the proper binders, antifungals up the nose and in the gut, you can make significant progress with depression, fatigue, sleep issues, gut problems, etc. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And I think you'd agree that in, in most cases, you need to address uh, probably all the all, all the cases you need to address the source of the mold, either get rid of the mold or remediate. But there are people who are not in a position to move. And I've come across patients and I'm sure you've come across patients, clients who just for whatever reason, they couldn't remediate. Maybe the spouse wasn't on board or for whatever. If that's the case, is there any hope of taking binders, doing things from a glutathione perspective, or do they really need to get rid of that source of the mold? Yeah, great question. You know, it's always about, it's like a seesaw, right? I mean, if you've got a really big fat guy on one side and a skinny guy on the other, fat guy's always going to win the seesaw battle. And so if you take that analogy and you visualize that for the rate of detox as opposed to the rate of exposure, if you've got this massive exposure, your bathroom leaked, your kitchen leaked, whatever, your basement flooded, you have exposure off the charts, and you're just doing like a couple of capsules of charcoal per day, you're going to lose the battle. But if you kind of flip that, maybe you're able to remediate some of the issue. You can't fix the whole house, but you fix the big like wet wall or the cabinet that flooded or whatever, and your rate of exposure is now lower than your rate of detox, then you win the game. And... You can implement fresh air into the home. So if you have decent weather outside and you can open your windows and flood the place with fresh air and dilute the mycotoxins, that's obviously helpful. If you spend a lot of time outside and away from it, maybe you work outside the home or maybe you have the ability to work out in the garden during the day and air the house out, like if you truly can't cut it out. But truthfully, cost-wise, it shouldn't be much. You know, some of these remediation companies, they'll charge you $10,000 plus, and you kind of have to be careful about vetting these people because 
if they do mold testing and remediation, it's probably not a good idea because they're biased, right? They're, of course, they're going to say it's a problem and they need to remediate you. So I would try to find an independent tester that doesn't do remediation. But sheetrock is not expensive. So if there's wet drywall and baseboard, cut it out, put a new piece in, patch it up, paint it up, put your trim back on, you're done. So people get overwhelmed by this conversation because it's their personal home, it's their it's their sacred space, it's their sanctuary. And people think that when they talk about mold, it means they're dirty. No, my house was pristine. I had air filters in every room. I had a whole house water filtration system. I mean, this is a, a top-notch house and it was still moldy and still made me sick. So please like get rid of any brainwashing you have. Don't feel that you're dirty or you know, you're a messy person or you're a nasty person if you have mold. This happens to the best of us. And I've seen houses that are two, three million dollars and they're moldy. And I've had clients in these million dollar plus homes that are moldy. And yeah, you're right. It's the husband usually who's a skeptic, who's this online guy. And what does he know? And guess what? The wife continues to suffer. And then it affects their marriage because now she's exhausted. So she has no sex drive. So the husband's mad about that. It's like, dude, look, if, if you want a good sex life, fix the mold. If you use that as the carrot in front of them, then usually they'll get motivated enough. And the husband goes, oh, okay, all right, we'll fix it. If that means I can, you know, save my sex life, save my marriage. Um, unfortunately, our, our hedonistic, uh, uh, you know, human traits uh, can't be ignored. But if you lean into that, usually you can get these people on board and they'll fix the home. Now, you mentioned, which I agree, about hiring someone who maybe is not doing the remediation because they're more likely to find something that might not be there. Uh, but what do, what do you think about hi, uh, doing it on your own? Like there's companies like Michael Metrics where people could just order the test and just basically do it on their own without hiring a specialist. I love it. I think it's a great place to start. And I encourage almost every client I work with to do that. So yeah, if you're going to do like an ERMI or a Hertz me, these are where you basically go around and kind of grab a bunch of dust and send it back to the lab and see what shows up. You can do those. I prefer the Petri dishes. So these little plates that have almost like a gum resin on them where mold will start to grow. So these Petri dishes, you put them on the floor in various rooms of the home for an hour. You put the lid on, mark them, master bedroom, kitchen, living room, basement, attic, car. A lot of cars are moldy. Mercedes did a recall on two and a half million cars because mold was growing in the air conditioning system. So even if you have a luxury car, it could be moldy. So if you drive somewhere and by the time you get to work, you have a headache, consider it's your car that's moldy. It could be a problem. So these Petri dishes are cheap. It's like three bucks. Or if you do it with a lab analysis, it's like 30 bucks for a plate. And you get a health score. And then based on that score, we also like to see, well, what's in the home and does that match up to what's in the urine? 90% of the time, it does not match, meaning that mold exposure was from years ago. That was the moldy college dorm. That was your previous house. That was your childhood home. That was your grandma's house that you hung out in. So it's rare that we find current exposure as the source. It still happens, but we often find that this is a, a story that started long ago, but we're just now getting the answers, just now getting the data. So just to clarify, you're saying that someone might do a, a home test for mold or even have someone come to the house and test for mold, and it might be negative, yet they will show positive findings on either an oat test or a mycotoxins test? Exactly. Yeah. And then they, they scratch their head and say, well, where the heck is this coming from? And I just tell them, look, it's probably a long time ago. Could have been years. Could have been months, years, decades. You never know. Or it could have been their office, right? If they work outside of the home and the office is a commercial building that's had water damage, something like that. So we try to find it, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't find the source. So we just have to assume that it was from the past. You know, it's also been proven that mold toxin goes through the placenta. So this could even happen from birth. I've been fortunate to test many young children. Almost half my practice is children these days. And, you know, we see kids that are six months old and they're off the charts with mycotoxins, even though they're living in a new house or a new apartment or something, and they still have mold off the charts. And then we test the mom. And then the mom has the same mold toxins, but way higher. And we go, oh my God, look, we've just opened up the dam through the breast via the breast milk and or the placental transfer. And, and that's how we see it. Same with like flame retardants and stuff. I mean, unfortunately, uh, breast milk is 
highly contaminated with various toxins. And so it's a big thing where we're seeing one and two year old children that have major gut issues, major skin issues. We're even seeing thyroid antibodies in young children. It's very difficult to get blood on them, but some cases when things are severe enough, we do. And we're seeing Hashimoto's in young kids. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. When it comes to mold in children, do you treat them the same as far as like using binders and glutathione? Obviously you try to get rid of the exposure, but the actual treatment, is it similar? Yeah. Protocol is the same. We just use a lot more liquid protocols than capsules. As you know, certain binders you have to open up and we can mix them in with juice or applesauce or something. So I'll try to find alternatives to the capsule formulas and we'll use liquid antimicrobials instead. We'll do some nasal sprays and such. And it works great. Kids get better faster. You know, their immune systems are generally more robust than us adults. Their thymus is much, much bigger. So they have this big uh, immune reserve, if you will, that, that we don't. So it's a lot easier and it definitely makes you look like a better practitioner when you're working with a kid because you can get them better in, you know, half the time that it takes for an adult to get better generally. And then with the, so you brought up an example of a patient's organic acids test, which showed molds. Let's say that everything was, was negative. The first time you tested is, have you seen where the oat is negative yet the urinary mycotoxins test is positive? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. So there's kind of two things that can happen. You can be colonized for mold, meaning you're a mold factory. So you're actually growing it. Maybe you had a lot of exposure or the exposure was long or your immune system was weakened. For example, maybe you had COVID, your immune system was weak. You then got exposed to mold and became colonized. So that's what we look at on the oat is, hey, are they actually growing it? Do we see on page one there, do we see these yeast and or fungal metabolites elevated, indicating they're currently growing mold? Or like you said, if that's all negative, but the mycotoxins are positive, then we assume they're just a mycotoxin reservoir. You know, that's the most accurate thing. They're, technically, it's not a mold. It's a mycotoxin that they're holding in them. It's the mold fart. That's the mycotoxin. And we see that all the time. So, you know, half the people are colonized, maybe half the people aren't. But you still have to work on the client and not just the paper, right? So if we see that there's gut issues and skin issues, maybe we run a stool test on them as well. And we see dysbiosis or other infections. Well, as you know, a lot of these herbs are pretty broad spectrum. So if I'm, let's say, working on parasites, I might have some herbs in that formula that also kill yeast and or fungus and or mold anyway. So even if the oat wasn't a big like smoking gun for mold colonization, we're probably helping to fix it anyway. Yeah, so it sounds like you don't always, like you don't test everybody for urinary mycotoxins. Is that correct? I or? do. I do. Oh, you do? Can. Yeah, if, if budget permits, I'm going to tell them, hey, at least initially for our first call together, when we first start out, I want everybody to have an oat and a myco. I'm just seeing too many to ignore it. Now, if budget doesn't permit or if this person says, hey, I know I feel better on binders. I've already done this in the past. And I'll say, okay, fine. Like if you don't care to see the numbers, these tests aren't perfect. They're good, but not perfect. So we'll just say, hey, look, if you're not wanting to spend the money or you can't spend the money and or you're already feeling good on binders, then just keep up binders. And, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, I when I test, I, I can't say I test everybody for the urinary mycotoxin test. But when I do test for that, I typically use Great Plains, again, now known as Mosaic. But you're, you're, have you had uh, Neil Nathan, Dr. Neil Nathan on the podcast? on your podcast i, yeah, I so haven't he, and he's not a fan of that but i know he likes real time and i was gonna say i think he uses both right i thought he uses real i've i think it was and maybe it was someone else who uses real time and you know great plains mosaic just because sometimes i'll find the mycotoxins on one but not the other so. Yeah, Vibrant. Vibrant is another competitor as well. I've used them before. And actually, Vibrant showed mycotoxins in me personally that I didn't see anywhere else. So I don't know what to make of it. But, you know, if you talk with Neil, he basically says binders for life. And I'm cool with that because these things that we're using, zeolite, clay, silica, ful fulvic acid, chlorella, etc., you know, these are great for heavy metals and pesticides. And we're all exposed to that too, no matter how hard we try. And I love the idea of just keeping up with a little bit of low dose binders. So maybe your test missed something. Maybe your mycotoxin test wasn't perfect. I still do binders. It helps with the die off too for any gut infections and other issues we're working on. Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, whatever we're doing there. 
the die off from some of that stuff can be intense and the binders help mop that up. Also, zeolite can help with histamine issues. So a lot of these people have histamine problems as well. So I really like to implement binders for everyone. Even if the test says there's nothing there, we're still going to use it and see what they report back. And if they say, Hey, I'm sleeping better, which is my story. I started experimenting with binders before bed and my wife and I both noticed, Hey, we're sleeping better. This is cool. So then we started using it with our kids and the kids slept better too. We're like, cool. So everyone needs binders at night. Done. Okay. So every everybody in the household's like taking low dose binders on a wellness basis then? Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, my kids do. My wife and I do too. I do give or take a couple capsules a night. Sometimes I'll do them in the middle of the day too if I feel kind of out of it. You know, sometimes I'll still experience some brain fog from it. Um, when you're colonized with mold and or candida, a lot of people are going to have brain fog. So like you walk into the pantry, you forgot what you're looking for or you forget your keys. Where's your phone? You're always losing something like that type of brain fog can happen uh, a lot with candida too. So mold is really the the bad guy that allows these other things to take place so if you've been working on candida and bacteria and you're struggling and not beating that it's like this relapsing type phenomenon assume that there's mold there because candida rarely occurs in isolation uh, i did a summit on candida years ago was, i guess 2017 and at the time i didn't know much about mold and now that I look back, all these people that had all these candida problems, you know, we were using herbal antimicrobials and things to hit those herbal antifungals and the candida would come back. I'm like, okay, well, let's just rotate herbs. And now I realize, well, crap, that was mold. Mold was allowing the candida to come back. Mold was giving candida the opportunity to thrive. And candida produces acetaldehyde, which is very similar to alcohol. So a lot of people just feel kind of drunk and spacey with candida and that would get better temporarily and then they'd relapse. So now I go back and I test those people and they all have mold. Wow. That's yeah. That, again, something that definitely is uh, overlooked. And uh, if I don't know if you can answer this, but if you had to put a number on it, what percentage of clients that you see would you say have a mold problem? Um, I'm sure it's high because a lot of people now know you as a mold expert and see you. So I don't know. Again, yours might be higher than the average person. But if you had to guess and say the average household, maybe that doesn't see you then. Would you say it's like 50%, 60%, 80%? I'd say probably 90. Wow. It's huge. It's huge. I think it's the biggest epidemic facing the country, if not the world right now. And uh, people even in the, I know you've seen this too with your, your clinical work, that even in the last five years, the average person is sicker and more complex and more sensitive than ever before. Obviously, there's a lot of things that go into that media and bioweapons and other things that kind of play into this. But overall, I find the population to be getting sicker, more sensitive, more nutrient depleted, more depleted of vitamins and minerals. And therefore, this mold is, is really just the, the final dagger, if you will. So I would say it's probably 90%. It's very rare these days that I test someone and don't show up with something. Now, you're right. A lot of people are now saying, hey, I heard you talk about this. I had this exposure. I have 50 symptoms. Can you help? But there's still average guys. Like I actually had a case in uh, California. This was just some real estate investor guy who said, hey, I feel pretty good, but I heard you and I want to get a good functional medicine workup and I don't have many complaints. I'm like, okay, fine. And we look at this guy's labs. He's colonized with mold. His mycotoxins were off the chart. I'm like, you're sure you have no energy issues? You're not depressed. You're not anxious. You don't have erectile dysfunction. Your blood pressure's okay. And he's like, yep, I'm fine. I'm like, well, this is weird, but I don't want to ignore this because... Mycotoxins are very carcinogenic, so ochratoxin affects the brain and the kidneys. Things like aflatoxin can affect the liver and be a big, big driver of liver cancer. So I'm like, look, if we don't want you to end up with some neurodegenerative disease as you get older, then let's get this stuff out now. So we got this guy on the protocol, and now he's losing body fat. So he was working with a personal trainer and he couldn't lose much body fat. Now he's leaning out. So we're seeing some cool benefits even though he didn't really have many complaints. Now he's saying, oh, I'm not as tired at the end of the day. I thought that was just normal because I'm working hard. It's like, mm, shouldn't really crash at 3 p.m. You should be able to keep going. So that's fun when, when you see a case where supposedly they're okay, but then you fix them anyway, and now all of a sudden they're better. That's always rewarding. Yeah, that is a lot of fun when you see someone, um, just the life changes that they make in their health. So thyroid. So as you know, this is... A 
the Save My Thyroid podcast, and people want to know how does mold affect the thyroid. Uh, let's let's dive into the the mold gut thyroid connection. Sure, sure. Well, I would say it's a domino effect, right? Like everything else, there's kind of this perfect storm that happens. Do I think that Hashimoto's and Graves and other thyroid issues can just kind of happen on their own with stress and that sort of thing? Maybe, but you know, the more I look at this, I really think of the thyroid issue as the effect, like the end result. And so here's the domino effects that I've, I've seen. And so I'll just lay it out to you the way I kind of perceive it now. And, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it too, which is, I think step one is like, there's some sort of trigger, if you will, like mold, for example. So let's just role play and say, okay, you had this mold exposure that weakened your immune system. And so now you developed candida overgrowth. And while the back door was open, so to speak, now you have developed Klebsiella, which we know is a big bacterial trigger of any sort of thyroid issue, autoimmune thyroid. So now you have Klebsiella and maybe you have Prevotella and Proteus. So now maybe you've got a diagnosis of RA and Hashimoto's or Graves, for example. You've got this multiple autoimmune thing happening. Now we see that you've got gut inflammation, the nutrition's off, you're super stressed, you're working too much, you, you, your kids are crazy, your marriage is on the rocks, like all those things add up and then boom, you happen to test blood and hey, there's a big thyroid issue. But I think there's probably other things predating you seeing that manifestation there. So I've seen cases where we've seen antibodies like TPO antibodies in the thousands, like two or 3,000, and then we've seen that drop thousands of points just by fixing what I'm describing to you, the candida, the bacteria, the mold piece, all of a sudden antibodies go way, 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 way down. And I didn't even give any quote thyroid support or thyroid protocol. Maybe I did like basic stuff, zinc, selenium, uh, those kind of things. But it's actually rare that I have to make a full thyroid protocol. It's almost as if these other gut detox type protocols are actually helping the thyroid. It's almost like we're just removing the roadblocks that allow the thyroid to be under attack in the first place. Yeah, I, I agree. In most cases, it's not a thyroid problem. I mean, Graves and Hashimoto's, as you know, they're immune system conditions that affect the thyroid and all these things you just mentioned, the molds, the candida overgrowth, the Klebsiella, you know, all these other, you know, gut microbes can, or, well, mold, not a gut microbe, but all these, all these factors can affect the gut, which you need a healthy gut to have a healthy immune system. And one thing I don't think either one of us mentioned is molds. Also the mycotoxins can increase the permeability of the gut as well. Yeah, good point. Yeah, there's some good literature on that. There's some good pictures. If you just put in like PubMed leaky gut or, you know, or uh, like mycotoxin leaky gut, you can find it. But yeah, that, that's a great point, which is that these people that are so clean with their diet, they're confused. How could I have some autoimmune issue? I'm off gluten. I'm off dairy. I'm off grains. Like I'm doing the perfect diet that everyone tells me to do this kind of autoimmune protocol, if you will, for diet but yet their gut's still a mess. And that's exactly right. Not only do, do the lipopolysaccharides and the endotoxins from bacteria affect the gut barrier, but mold toxin does as well. So if you're taking all these leaky gut protocols, leaky gut supplements, but you're full of mold and mold toxin, you're not going to fully get better. And what impact will moldy foods have? Because because we focus more on the indoor air, the but if someone's eating grains or nuts that are moldy on a regular basis, I would assume that also could prevent someone's gut from healing. Yeah, I think this is tough to prove. But if I were to give you like a pie chart of exposure, I would say the biggest piece of the pie is probably 90% inhalation, because you breathe on average, like 20,000 times a day, versus you're eating in snacking maybe what three to five times a day so just your overall consumption i think is significantly less in the diet it is true that you can have moldy coffee moldy chocolate moldy grains for example there's one study out of uh, guatemala and apparently liver cancer is very high in guatemala and it was connected to moldy corn tortillas which are a huge staple in the diet down there so corn can be highly contaminated with various mycotoxins and this also can affect fertility and create miscarriages and birth defects and other problems for females so remember that 
you know, we're talking gut thyroid here, but there's this big endocrine system effect as well, because a lot of mycotoxins are highly, highly estrogenic. So if you're mm -hmm. having breast tenderness or other problems, female issues, hormone problems, uh, PMS and, and worse, that could also be uh, a part of it. But I would say the diet is a smaller piece. I will say this is probably why some people feel better. Most people feel better on a grain free or more paleo template because they've already eliminated maybe some nuts, seeds, grains, and therefore they got rid of the mold. Like you're not going to have a moldy steak. Now the cows, if they're fed grain, that's moldy, moldy corn that's sprayed with glyphosate and the GMO products are in the cow's diet. Could that impact the quality of the meat? I would say so. I would still prefer people get pasture raised meats if they can. But overall, you know, if you had to choose your battles and you had the option of living in a moldy home, and um, eating clean or living in a clean home and eating McDonald's, just a hamburger patty only with no bun and no cheese, I'd probably do that because the buildings really wreck you far more. All right. That's, that's interesting. Obviously, you're not recommending for people to eat ha McDonald's hamburger patties, but yeah, if they had to choose between being in that moldy environment and not eating as clean as you would normally recommend. So that does that does make sense. Now, I know you use natural binders, but what's your thoughts on cholestyramine? And, and I'm asking you for a reason, not just for the mold. I don't know if you know this, but cholestyramine could also bind to thyroid hormones. So it's actually used as a treatment for some people with hyperthyroidism. And this is in the literature, which I didn't know like years ago. Um, I, I found it in the research. And then since then, I've had some patients get cholestyramine prescribed by the endocrinologist if they're unable to tolerate the antithyroid medication. And so it's not ideal, definitely not the first line of treatment, but I wanted to get your opinion, what you th think of cholestyramine just in general, obviously like in this situation for the binding of mycotoxins. Sure. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't know that. I mean, it's a pretty remarkable compound. So folks listening that might not be familiar with it, it was created, I think it was sometime in the 60s or 70s, it was used as a cholesterol lowering medication, but then statins came out. And I believe they work in a different mechanism than this. And so cholestyramine really just kind of fell off, like maybe there's not as much profit in it or something. I don't know what the story was of why it became uh, just kind of this forgotten about product or compound. You can get it compounded from compounding pharmacies, which I have, and I've personally taken cholestyramine. I'll tell you this, though, and nobody's talking about this, and it's kind of frustrating because if I would have had more warning on this, I probably wouldn't have messed with it. But number one, it's really tough on the gut. I think it really exacerbated histamine problems for me. I don't really feel like I had many histamine issues until I started to use cholestyramine. So I don't know if it changed something with the gut barrier. It was too harsh. It was detoxing too strong. And that aggravated my mast cells, creating more histamine issues or what the mechanism was. But I definitely felt that it messed up my gut. Um, secondly, there's an impact on the mitochondria from cholestyramine. So I think it made my fatigue issues worse. And most people don't mention that they kind of mention it as this if, if you're a richie shoemaker uh trained md you know a lot of these conventional mold doctors they kind of make fun of natural binders and natural binders have saved hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases in, in, in my situation where these people were at the end of their rope and we got them better with natural binders so this idea that that one is better than the other or that natural uh, compounds can't work it's simply not true um cholestyramine in the beginning, though, it did get me out of the hole. I was in a dark place for a while. I had a lot of dizziness and vertigo. And when I started cholestyramine, I almost had instant relief. It's a much stronger binder than something like charcoal. Stronger meaning it's a tighter bond to that toxin, whereas charcoal is kind of a weaker bond. So think of it like a strong magnet versus a weak magnet. So when you're using something like charcoal, it is true that some of the mycotoxins will essentially fall off and get reabsorbed back into the system and you can have a die off or almost like a Herxheimer reaction from simply binders. And you would think binders are just this perfect benign substance and all it's going to do is pull bad things out of you. But when I was taking six, seven, eight uh, charcoal capsules per day, just to experiment, I was messed up. I was not feeling well. So that told me, Hey, this is not a perfect product. Whereas when I did cholestyramine, it was so strong that uh, I almost felt more clear headed than with the natural binders. So 
there's a pros and cons list of thing. Do I think it's necessary to get better? No, but cholestyramine apparently is one of the only compounds on the planet to get out non-stick chemicals. So, you know, like the forever chemicals we hear about, it appears that cholestyramine can bind to those and pull those out. So that's kind of cool. So maybe at a minimum, I at least pulled chemicals out of my body that natural compounds wouldn't. Hmm, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And I, I can't say I've had a lot of patients on cholestyramine. Typically, they'll be either on the the herbs, like things like bugleweed, motherwort, for those with hyperthyroidism, or they'll be on the antithyroid medication. But if they can't tolerate the antithyroid medication, and let's say the herbs aren't effective, the natural agents aren't effective, if it's a choice between getting their thyroid gland removed or the radioactive iodine or the cholestyramine, I would recommend the cholestyramine. But uh, yeah, Agreed. that's... Agreed. Well, they probably have mold toxin anyway, so why not give them the cholestyramine? And therefore, you're helping thyroid and you're detoxing them. So I think it's a. I think in your case, it'd be it'd be a great strategy. And I love that you use and implement um, motherwort too, because you're one of the few guys out there that that really know and, and talk about motherwort as much as I do. It's one of my favorite herbs. I take it, you know, a few times a week. You know, five, ten, fifteen drops sometimes, because. You know, the stress and the trauma and the grief associated with this whole conversation is significant. You know, we're talking uprooting people from their family homes. We're talking having to sell or uh, remediate or renovate. So you're talking marriage stress, financial stress, right? There's a lot of other collateral damage that happens with this whole conversation. And Mother Ward is not only a great tool for what you're using in the thyroid cases, but it's amazing for emotional trauma and grief, heart palpitations, AFib, atrial flutter, blood pressure irregularities. So Mother Ward is a really good ally throughout this process. Yeah, I agree. It also has some antimicrobial effects as well. So that's that's cool that you uh, that you take it on a on a regular basis. I didn't know that. So yeah. thanks. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And any, I know there's so much more we could cover, and I, but I know you got to run soon. So before we wrap it up, is there anything burning in you that you want to say, or did you want to just give like a summary of like if someone thinks they're suspecting they might have a mold problem, what would be the next steps? Yeah, my advice would be if you haven't done some good labs, so test your home and test your body yet, then that would be a great investment because if you wait until you get the cancer diagnosis or the Alzheimer's diagnosis or some other really scary thing that's going to have a lot of pharmaceutical uh, interventions and potentially surgeries and all of that, I mean, you can really save yourself from some of that if you get your body clean and you get these toxins out. This is not a rare situation. This is an extremely common situation, and I bet a large amount of money that the folks listening and or their family members, their parents, their children, their grandchildren are probably walking around with mold toxin in them because the average person spends roughly 95% of their time indoors in the modern world versus just a short time ago in the 1800s when we were all farmers. We were outside all day, so even if the old farmhouse was moldy, which it was probably less moldy because they use plaster and not drywall with paper backing. So the housing materials have changed. How tight our homes are have changed. So there's a lot of things that have happened in a very, very short amount of time in terms of building technology that have made us more prone to having mold issues. And I encourage people to remember that this is a multi-generational problem. I've tested grandma, daughter, granddaughter, and I've seen it through the family line. So if you're one of those people that walks around saying, hey, family illness, like mental illness runs in the family. Well, yeah, maybe you're indicating that there's mold illness running in the family. And that's why you're all chronically fatigued, obese, depressed, anxious, etc. Of course, nutrition plays a role. But I've seen these families where they're all crazy. Mold causes rage. So if the kid's having behavioral issues, the mom is on an antidepressant, the grandma had a nervous breakdown. Like these are the things you have to look for in your workup with people to really kind of plot the dots here and go, oh, grandma was nuts, mom's nuts, kids are nuts. Okay, we got to figure this out. And if you dig deep enough, and you'll spend maybe a couple thousand bucks to, to do a really good workup on yourself. But if you do this, you're going to save yourself massive suffering. You're potentially going to save your marriage if your marriage isn't good. You're going to save the money from not having to send your kid off to behavioral therapy 
and speech therapy and occupational therapy and all these other interventions that you'll try to do to mitigate the toxicity because the speech can be affected in children as well. And that's something that most practitioners don't recognize. There's also a big link, and that's why you and I love uh, and have used Great Plains, now Mosaic, because of the link between autism spectrum issues and mold toxin. And any child who's on the spectrum at any level, any degree of severity, we're going to run chemicals and mold toxin, and guess what? We're going to find it 99 out of 100 times in these kids. So this is something that I hope will become more popular and mainstream, but at this time, there's very few people talking about this and even less uh, pediatricians talking about this. I even I know some really good functional pediatricians, and even them are not really doing the work that I'm doing with this kind of stuff. So that's why I've, I've built up and had to become an expert at kids, mainly because I have three of my own, but also because... Who else is going to save the kids? At the current rate of toxicity that I'm seeing and the current rate of fatigue and behavioral issues and lack of motivation and all that, I really don't know how society will continue to function if we don't start getting people healthier because who's going to be the garbage man? If everyone's too tired to pick up a, a garbage can and throw it in the back of the truck and drive away, who? Who is going to take care of society how is society going to continue to run if our health is so chronically bad like this so we've got a mess on our hands and you know i hope that people like you and i can can put a dent in it but we need others out there so if you are a parent and you need help reach out and let's help your family and if you're a practitioner then i would encourage you to learn about this stuff and if you're interested i have functional medicine training courses that people can take i have over 1200 students in there and a lot of them are practitioners. It's maybe an 80-20 split, so maybe 80% you know, health seeker, 20% practitioner. Uh, but the, the big flagship one that I have is called Better Belly. And this is a course where I've taken uh, a lot of case studies, and we've put those into an easy-to-understand and digest format. I'll show you just real quick if people want to check it out. And also, we could probably get a coupon code for your audience. So uh, if people want to get a better deal on it, they can. Uh, this is a fraction of the cost of one semester of college, and you're going to learn way more than you will in college, I promise. Uh, but this course here, I have a full curriculum. It's over 53 lessons, anything from ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, um, IBS, um, candida, more candida protocols, um, stomach acid. We talk about SIBO and CIFO, H. pylori, clostridia, heart issues, and H. pylori, parasites, and then I have all these calls where I'm on the call with my clients, and you can kind of listen to what the clients are saying. Um, a histamine intolerance case study. We go into lab testing. We go into supplements. I got some mold experts here. Um, this is a professional uh, mold inspector. This guy here owns a mold testing company. So uh, here's a talk I gave on how mycotoxins create all these issues. I have a presentation on how to improve your home health. So so there's a lot of stuff. And I'm motivated and really hungry to, to get this out. So I'm going to keep charging full speed ahead. And I appreciate our time together. It's been great. Yeah, same here, Evan. Can you verbally say, even though you just showed that, can you verbally say the website? Where can people sign up for the Better Belly program or if they want to work with you one-on-one -on -one, as well as check out your podcast? Sure, thanks so much. Yeah, it's evanbrand.com. So E-V-A-N brand, like brand name, B-R-A-N-D, evanbrand.com. Everything's there. And yeah, you can check out the podcast too. We're going to get you on there as well. And uh, so you'll see Eric's pretty face on the podcast soon. And it's it's all free. The podcast is all free. The courses are paid, but the podcast is, is absolutely free. And uh, consultations, I have me, and then I have another functional practitioner on my team. So if you all need help, then we'll be here. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks, Evan. Definitely we'll put those links in the show notes. And uh, great chatting with you. Definitely check out Evan's podcast. Look into his um, Better Belly course. Or if you want to set up a consultation with Evan, definitely uh, contact him and his team. And again, thank you so much for uh, this conversation. I, I, I learned a lot as well. Thanks for having me, man.